Right guys, so um, do you have any questions now for me about anything? I mean, I know that you are on the way up now. In a, in a year or so, you'll be sitting there, hopefully, in the right seat next to me or any of the other line training captains. So is there anything that you're thinking about? Anything that you, you know, you've been thinking about before, maybe that I can help with answering? Which area do you think new cadets that come in uh, lack knowledge uh, these days? What do you think uh, that should be better in the future? Well, to be perfectly honest, people are coming in with quite high knowledge normally. Um, but there are areas where they are going to, to need to work when they come into line training. Um, first of all, you have the uh, type rating to go through first. Right? And the type rating will be very demanding. Now, you guys are used to demanding training because you're doing this in what, how many months is this course taking? 16, 16 months. So you, you're going through all of the ATPL theory, all of the training, all of the flying and everything in 16 months. So you're used to the pace. But when it comes to the type rating, it is a new ball game, right? It's, it's the whole thing going from where you are pretty much now until flying a 737 from the right seat in about two months. So the, the more that you guys can prepare before you start your typewriting, the better it is. When you get your hands on the theoretical material, so the, the technical uh, manual, start reading it as soon as possible. Because if you get a little bit ahead, so when you start your typewriting, which is going to be starting with um, text, technical CBTs, computer-based training, um, and an examination, if you have read up on the technical stuff already, it means that you can spend your, um, your energy on preparing for how to learn scan flows, how to learn procedures together with your sim partner. So make the most out of your type rating because the more you learn there and the better you are when you get out, the easier it will be when you come to line training later on. Um, areas that we see that people need, like maybe you, you, you're not really aware of, but you will be when you start your line training is that it is very demanding on you both physically and mentally. Okay, you'll be flying under time pressure. There's no delay code for uh, training. So you'll, be able, you'll need to do what a trained pilot is doing already from the beginning. And that comes down to you preparing. And this maybe might be a, a, an area where people think that they might be a little bit more spoon-fed than what they will actually be in reality. It's going to be up to you to prepare you know, what arrivals and departures are you going to fly. Um, if there's an airfield brief telling you about the the um, destination that you're going through, you would have been expected to have read through that before. Um, you need to have rested properly. So, you know, get yourself accommodation, unless you're getting accommodation by the airline, close to the base you're going to fly out to, so you get properly rested, get, take food with you, keep drinking and eating, because you will forget that. Right? There's going to be so much new stuff that's happening all around you that people forget to eat. And what we see is during the fourth sector or so, the blood sugar start dropping, you start making mistakes that you wouldn't have done otherwise. So just, you know, eat something on each sector. But be prepared, okay? Read up on everything that you can prepare for. That means checking the weather the day before. You know, where are the problem areas going to be? Is it going to be fog in one place? Is it going to be high crosswind? You need to know that. The, the no times, it's not going to change much from a day, one day to another. This means that you can read up on the no times the, the, the day before. See. Is there any problem? Is the ILS not working on the destination? Well, in that case, prepare for a non-precision approach. What was that during the, the, uh, the type reading? How is that supposed to be flown? What about the vertical speed non-precision approach? We do those things. Like, I've, the last day I flew, we had, I think, two non-precision approaches on a four-sector day. Not because we were training, but because they were, the ILS was turned off. They turned off the ILS during the summer. When the weather is expected to be good, that's when they do their maintenance. So these kind of things, they happen. The better prepared you are, the better the line training will go. And then areas that you won't be able to prepare for, but you will struggle with in the beginning, is going to be things like rotation rates. The, uh, the 737, 800 specifically, you need to be very careful with your rotation rate. Make sure that you don't tail strike the thing. And this takes time, especially during line training in the beginning, the first 20 sectors or so, it's going to be trying to get a feel for how to rotate. And it's going to feel differently if it's a very light aircraft, if it's a very heavy aircraft, a lot of crosswind, headwind, temperature differences, slopes on the runway. All of this will make every rotation different. 
What people want to know, generally speaking, when, when we talk about rotations, is that how do you do a rotation correctly? Like, is there a, you know, how much back pressure do I need in order to do a rotation correctly? And the answer to that is, there is no correct way to do a rotation because they will always differ. So that's why rotations is a problem in the beginning, because you need to get a feel for the aircraft. You need to start rotating, feel when the aircraft is starting to, to lift the nose, judge whether or not you need a little bit more back pressure, a bit less, and then continue to, to, to pull it through when you get into the, the famous dead band at around seven or eight degrees pitch up. Okay? And it's going to be different for each, each time. So this is just you being exposed to the aircraft, learning from it. But it, it does take a few sectors to get that under control. And then, obviously, then there's going to be problems with um, descent management, energy management of the aircraft, understanding that the VNAV, which is going to be your best friend, by the way, is only so good. It's only as good as you have programmed it. So if you're descending into a destination with a long arrival route, and then all of a sudden air traffic controlling comes in and says, yep, turn right on this heading, you're cleared for the ILS, and you then cut six nautical miles off that the aircraft thought that it had in order to get itself down, then all of a sudden now you're hot and high. Now you need to get rid of the energy. And it's all about thinking in energy states. Rather than thinking, right, so this is a descent, uh, I need this many you know, feet, vertical speed per minute. It's going to be more about what is my kinetic energy? What is my potential energy? Height, speed. How can I trade this? Far out, I can go faster. I can increase my speed. Increasing the speed, you increase the drag means that you can descend, but you're also descending less per nautical mile. So that works when you're far out, but when you get closer to the airport, you might need to slow down and get flaps out in order to get more vertical speed per nautical mile to get down, because you need to get down at 10 miles. You need to be, you know, at least flaps one, back to 200 knots, to be able to start an approach and fly that in a stabilized way. So this, this is stuff that people struggle with throughout their line training and probably a good 100 sectors after the line training as well. More questions? Yeah. When it comes to um, um, type rating, um, what do you think is the best thing to do in order to simplify your life, to make it easier for you to get through? To get through the type rating? Yeah. Okay, um, that's a great question. And I kind of touched on that in the beginning. Um, you, you, you need to be well prepared and you need to not think that you are going to learn from your instructors at the day that you do your session. What you should be thinking, the way that you should be thinking this is that you should know what you're about to do for each session so that when you're, uh, when you're in your briefing, you're really just kind of, you know, fixing question marks, you're just asking something that you might not have understood. You're not expecting the instructor to tell you how to fly a non-precision approach. You already know that, but you might know, you might have questions about specific parts or why things have flown in a specific way. So once again, preparation is absolute key. So what I was saying in the, in the last question was that read through the technical manual, know the technical stuff even before you start your type reading so that you can spend the first bit of the type rating when you're doing your CBT, talking to your SIM partner and preparing for procedures, scan flows, things like that. So you're always one step ahead. If you're one step ahead, it means that, you know, if, you have, if you're struggling on one session of stuff, you're still a little bit ahead, right? You have more capacity available to you. But if you go into a SIM session thinking, today they're gonna teach me how to fly a non-precision approach, well, then you're already one step behind. Okay, and the instructor would be annoyed, very annoyed. So that's the thing, the key is preparation, all the time. Be prepared and work together with your colleague. Realize that now there are two of you that needs to succeed. If your sim partner is starting to struggle, is starting to have problems, well, you need to help him or her to get through because you're now a crew. And this is what it's about in this industry. It's you working as a team. You go out now, you fly your diamond or your Cessna stuff, it's up to what you're, how you are performing. But when you get into the APS MCC course later on, it's going to be how your crew performs. And when you go out working, it's exactly the same. It's how good are you as a crew to solve a potential problem? How do you work together with your cabin crew, with the engineers, with the ground handlers, the dispatcher? All of that, you just start to understand that this is a team effort. And you are only as good as your weakest link when it comes to this. And that goes really, you know, when it comes to your typewriting, that's really much the, uh, the case.
Be yeah. prepared. Be prepared and help each other out and prepare together. All right. It's not a solo game. It doesn't matter how good you are. If your sim partner is starting to lack, your performance as a crew is going to go down. And uh, could you go uh, through the um, type rating steps? You know, from the maybe the different uh, areas uh, you have. Uh, yeah. Um, yes. So you, you you will start like I said with the technical part, and that's because you need to understand the aircraft and the aircraft systems in order to understand the procedures. So you do the technical part and the technical exam, and then you tend to go into the fixed base training. And the fixed base training is you sitting in a simulator does not give you full flight because. There's no point on learning handling at that point. It's you're more about learning setup, scan flows, you know, how to do the performance calculations together, do all of that right. The, the fixed base, I think it's eight, I'm not, don't quote me on that, but I think it's eight fixed base sessions where you start from the most basic and then you work your way up until you're, you start to actually fly procedures and work with the QRH and non normals as well. And once you're through that, then you go into the full flight. Now the full flight becomes handling. So that's you feel, starting to feel things like rotations and turns and um, how to handle the aircraft during non-normal maneuvers. Uh, that is becoming quite advanced quite quickly. Okay, that's why we have such a long fixed base part. So that, that should be just natural to you at that stage. We can concentrate more on handling things like engine failures after takeoff and runaway stabilizers and stalls, non-normals like that. And then at the end of that, it's going to be a low-vis session and it's going to be a skill test where you get to show someone like me that you're good enough to fly online. All right? Like taking a step before the type rating for the assessment for a company. Yes. Was there any tips or the kind of attitude a student or any, any pilot should have doing the assessment? Yeah, I mean, you've already done an assessment in order to participate in this program, if I've understood this correctly. Uh, it's very similar to the kind of assessment that you can expect for an airline. Um, the interview part, and I've done videos about this, uh, the interview part, now I can only speak on behalf of the company that I work for. There are slight differences in what they want to see in personalities, depending on what company that you're applying to. But they want to hire someone that they can sit together with, you know, for 12 hours, locked in a place that's the size of, of a closet. So they want to have someone that's open, that they, that's clearly easy to teach, to learn that they want to see that, they want to see that you're easy to, to instruct and teach, but also that you have a nice personality, that you're open, that you can keep eye contact and answer normal questions. If you don't know something on in an interview, tell them. All right, I don't know the answer to that, I can look it up for you. You want to be, come off as being knowledgeable, obviously, but also a nice, nice person to work with. Now, I know that that's a little bit mushy as an answer, but I can't, that there's so many different companies out there, there's so many different types of assessments, that there's no, like, you do this, then you pass. I wish there was, it would be easy, and my YouTube channel would be much bigger.